Hello, church family. It's so good to be with you today. Everyone online, welcome. I am really excited about sharing this message today. Um, Not because I love being on stage, but because it's a message that God has put on my heart. Uh, Like Pastor Virch said, it's something that we've identified and seen for several years now. Um, And it's something that is very, um, it's it's just a really strong strategy the enemy uses in everyone's life. And so today, I really hope that you will lean in and be ready to receive the word that God has for us. Amen? Well, you know, I don't know about you. We all have different, you know, likes and preferences and and maybe you relax and, you know, we all can relax and unwind in certain ways. Well, one of my favorite ways to unwind, and this may seem a little weird to some of you, but I think some of you will identify with me. Um, One of the ways that I love to unwind after a long day of work, um, I like to go into my room, the kids are in bed, and I like to put on a good true crime episode. Okay, like a good dateline, a good 2020, you know, that, you know, it all started off and and all of a sudden they find a body, right? I know that's a little creepy. I know, but I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. And, you know, there's, I think the reason why I really enjoy watching these, because they always have a conclusion. I don't like watching those mysteries that are like, nobody ever finds out who the killer was. No, I like knowing like it's resolved by the end of the hour. We find out not only who did it, but how he did it and why he did it. And there's some kind of, it's like, like satisfaction, like some kind of like, okay, we know who the killer is, right? Like there was justice that was done or, you know, the, the, the bad guy was, was taken captive. And so I love those. Those really relax me. Like those really relax me. My kids know that. They're not allowed to watch them yet. <laughs> um, but I really love the fact when they just unmask the enemy. It's like they unmask the bad guy. It's like when you don't know who the bad guy is, it's kind of scary, right? It's scary. But when you know who it is, then you're like, okay, I see him coming. And so really that is my goal for today's message. I want to help unmask the enemy in all of our lives. Okay? Because let me tell you, our enemy, the enemy of our souls is sneaky, sneaky. He's deceptive. He, um, he uh, puts on masks and tries to cover up and, 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 and be like so no one can un- even detect that he's there. But Satan is a liar. The Bible says that he is the father of lies. And he has been using, you would think that he's, after all these thousands of years, he has a new strategy. He has some new plan. But really, it's the same strategy that he used back in the Garden of Eden that we talked about uh, two, two weeks ago when the lies of the, uh, how the enemy lied to Adam and Eve. And he's using those same strategies. He kills us with lies. He gets us to believe his lies. And one of the biggest lies and one of the biggest strategies that I have seen and noticed through many years is that he plants these seeds of rejection in our hearts. It happens to everyone, every single one of us, maybe on different levels, but it happens to all of us. I was thinking, actually, I was getting ready this morning. I didn't have this plan, but it's just like the memory popped in my mind. I remember, I think, one of the first times I felt rejected. And I was in kindergarten uh, here in South Florida. I was in school, and I was at the playground, and I wanted to fit in. I always felt like I didn't fit in because I happened to be, like, the only Hispanic girl in my class. So, like, my name is Ghislaine. Like, that's weird. Like, there's just so many things that I felt were so weird about me, right? And I just wanted to fit in with all the cool kids. And I remember the girls were playing, and for whatever reason, I was over listening to their conversation, and they were talking about, like, oh, so-and-so. Oh, well, he likes me, and I like him. This is kindergarten, guys, okay? Oh, and he he likes, oh, and I, he's my boyfriend, and she's the girlfriend, boyfriend. And so they went up to me, and they said, oh, Ghislaine, do you have a boyfriend? And so I wanted to fit in. I don't know why, but I just lied. I said, yeah. And they're like, oh, really? You have a boyfriend? Who's your boyfriend? And I was like, Billy Lampkin. Okay, Billy Lampkin. I still remember his name. It's, that's, he's actually out there. I hope he's out there anyways. Um, so he was this, this little, I remember he was like this redhead, had like a little mushroom haircut and had freckles. And I thought he was the cutest thing. I'd never spoken to him, of course. But of course, I just told the girls, oh yeah, he's my boyfriend. And so they were like, oh, Billy Lampkin. And they went running to Billy and they're like, Billy, Ghislaine says that you're his, you're her boyfriend or you're whatever. He's your, you're her boyfriend. And then he was like, ew, no. <gasps> I remember I watched when he said that. And I was like, my heart was like, oh, Not only was he, like, rejecting me and saying that that I was gross, obviously, you know, we're kindergarten, but he also, but he did this in front of the girls that I, like, looked up to and want to be a part of. Like, that was, like, so embarrassing to me and so humiliating. And I remembered that this morning when I was getting ready. But I think all of us can identify. We have all been rejected in some way, and sometimes it's something like that, and sometimes it's a little bit deeper, and it's a lot heavier. I remember when I was 15 years old and my parents were going through a divorce. I felt a very strong rejection in my heart. And so no matter how young 
or how old we are, Satan is constantly attacking us with this lie of rejection. Because why does he do it? Because he knows that it distorts our relationship with others, with our loved ones, with our family, with our friends, even with our family of faith here in the church. It even can affect our relationship with God. Enemy use, the enemy uses these seeds of rejection to cause people to be trapped in these lies, right, and then therefore limit their potential, limit, uh, be, like interrupt the purpose and the plan that God has for their lives to prevent us from walking in the freedom that Jesus came to give us. And so let me just say, this doesn't just happen with when you don't know God, with people who maybe are far from God. You know, I've seen this uh, in, so many, in so many people, even in my own life. Uh, and this isn't just back then, but even this week as I was preparing this message, I felt the enemy attacking me and like, oh, really? Uh, you know, is that going to be a good message? Is it going to be as good as Pastor Virgin's message? Are they going to compare you to so-and-so? Are you and it's just constantly attacking me. And so I had to stand firm in the promises of God, and that is what I want to share with you today. Because we see this root of rejection in so many lives. It can affect people that are new believers, just like people who've been in the church for a long time. Uh, Single, married, young and old, Satan does not discriminate. And so we want to um, unmask the enemy. Like I said earlier, we want to unmask him, not our, not our COVID mask, but we want to unmask the enemy. And because I think that when we see it and we identify it, then first of all, we don't have to be scared of it anymore. And then we can stand firm against, that, against the attacks of the enemy. And, you know, the reality is I think that this has been one of his strategies for a very long time right? But I think now in this past year with the season of of COVID and pandemic, when people are disconnected because of everything going on, it's, I feel like it's been magnified even more. I feel like I see it everywhere. And so we can have victory. We can have victory over this area in our lives. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in our time together. So will you pray with me as we prepare our hearts to receive what God has for us? Father, we come to you this day with open hearts, Lord, ready to receive your word, Jesus. I pray, God, that every single person that is listening to this message, whether they're here in person or they are online, God, that they would hear not my words, God, but the words that come directly from you, Jesus. I pray that you would unmask the enemy, his strategy, his schemes in our lives so that he can no longer have power over us in this area. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so rejection. What is rejection? Rejection is to refuse to not accept something, right? To exclude when you want to abandon, when something is abandoned or when something is dismissed, okay? And throughout all of scripture, we see people in the Bible that experienced rejection, okay? From Cain and Abel in the Garden of Eden, I'm sorry, in the, in the Garden in the beginning, to Joseph. We studied the life of Joseph uh, a few weeks back, uh, how he was rejected by his brothers. He was sold as a slave by his brothers. We see it in the life of David. Uh, David was one of the kings, uh, one of the greatest kings of Israel, and when uh, the prophet Samuel was told to go to the house where David lived and said, you know, there's going to be a a, a man there, one of the sons is going to be anointed, and the next king of Israel, he gets there and he asks, you know, um, was it Jesse? I forgot. Yeah, he asks Jesse, David's dad, he's like, oh, can you show me, bring all your sons. God's going to show me which one of these sons is going to be the next king. And the father calls all of his sons except David. Totally forgets about David. He's out taking care of the shepherds. And when he mentions him, he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about him. Okay, so imagine the rejection that David may have felt. We see it in the life of Moses. We see it in Gideon. We see it uh, in the disciples. We see it all throughout scripture. Even Jesus, okay, who was God in the flesh, The perfect man who never sinned was rejected. Look what Isaiah 53, 3 says. It says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Wow, Jesus, being God in the flesh, experienced the pain of rejection so that we would know that he can understand. He can understand what we feel when we are rejected. Now, how does the seed of rejection come into our lives? What are those open doors that the enemy has or uses for rejection to take root, okay? Because that's what we're talking about. Not that we're all rejected because that's a reality. We're, we've all been rejected and we're probably going to be rejected again, right, in the future. But the difference is, is when that rejection takes root in our hearts. And so I want to go over a questionnaire right now 
It's kind of like a diagnostic. And it may seem a little detailed. It may seem a little long for some. But I think it's very necessary so, so that we can, again, unmask what the, uh, the schemes and the plans of the enemy is in our lives. To be able to identify what the root of that rejection is. How it comes in, what are, the, what are the consequences or the results of that root being in our lives? So I want you to follow along with me. I don't need you to take notes. I, don't need, I just need you to listen. I don't want you to think about anybody else. I want you to allow this just to reflect upon your life, okay? So how does the rejection enter in our childhood? It can happen since the womb, when there was an unwanted pregnancy, when we weren't in our parents' plans, when there was an abortion attempt during the pregnancy. When we were born into adoption, being born with a gender different from what our parents wanted, being born with a disability or deformity, when there's constant criticism from parents or caregivers, abandonment or death of one of our parents, divorce, to be given nicknames that highlight negative characteristics about us or our physical appearance, being ridiculed in public, having speech delays or learning disabilities, when we come from a very poor family context where there is a shortage of money and resources and we are deprived of receiving things that we see others have, when there is sexual abuse, incest, mistreatment from parents, cruelty from parents, or even absent parents, belonging to a racial minority, environment, when we grow up in an environment that is exposed to alcoholism, any type of substance abuse or addiction, Rejection from classmates, teachers, friends, or leaders. Now, how does rejection enter into our lives as adults? When we are unfairly, unfairly fired or mistreated at work? When we suffer big financial failures? When our boyfriend or girlfriend or spouse leaves us for another person? When there are very strong betrayals of loved ones? When there is rejection from teachers, bosses, or people in authority? When there's racism through physical and sexual abuse? So these are some examples of how the root of rejection can come into our lives, how the enemy wants to use these situations, these very painful situations, some of them completely out of our control, um, to cause these roots of bitterness to be planted in our hearts and in our lives. And so maybe you say, you know, I can relate to some of these situations, but how can we identify if there's still a root there? And I think that just like in the physical, I think that sometimes, you know, we don't normally see roots of plants. We see the fruit of it, right? The roots are usually under the surface. And I think that that's why it's so important to, sometimes we don't identify the roots, but we know that there's some kind of fruit, right? And so it doesn't do me any good if I plant an apple seed and the, the plant, the tree grows and starts producing apples. If I cut all the apples off the tree, I can go and cut all the apples off the tree. But if the root is still there, what's going to happen? We're going to get more apples, right? And so I think that's what happens. The enemy wants to distract us in so many different things. Oh, just change your behavior. Oh, if you change this. But really, we need to attack the root and allow, the, allow God to uproot it. Amen? We need God to uproot it completely so therefore there is no more fruit in our lives. So I want to basic, I want to go over now what are some of the results or what is some of that fruit of the root of rejection in our lives. So listen, uh, please follow along, just listen. I tend to isolate myself. I feel like I don't fit in. I am a loner. I resort to attention-seeking behavior. I constantly need people's approval. I avoid conflicts. I don't want to bother anybody. I want to be invisible. I'm afraid of being alone. I easily fall into emotional dependence on others, not in healthy relationships, but rather in codependent relationships. I judge others too much. I'm always suspicious of others, and, having a, and I have a hard time trusting. I'm prideful. I do not give in easily. I don't like losing. I don't like asking for forgiveness. I have a very hard time forgiving. I have a hard time letting go of the past. I feel paranoid. I feel that others are talking about me, that they're looking at me, that they're going to judge me, that they're going to reject me, that they're going to take, take something away that belongs to me. I feel that people always take advantage of me. I tend to blame others. Well, you told me this, and if you had told me, or how come you didn't warn me? Well, you know, it was just that you, when you did this, I'm a perfectionist. I work, uh, some may think that I have an addiction to work. And you know what, maybe you think that your perfectionism or that your work addiction are part of your personality or your temperament. But I want you to ask God, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit if maybe, perhaps, behind that, there's a root of rejection. I get offended very easily. I'm very sensitive to what others tell me. How they tell me, when they tell me, where they tell me, why do they tell me. 
I'm very fearful. I have fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of authority, fear of confrontation, fear of being disapproved, fear of making decisions. I, si I suffer from anxiety attacks, panic attacks, and constant stress. I like to take charge and control, wanting to have everything in perfect order. It's hard for me to delegate. I feel that if I don't do it, others aren't capable of doing it. I find myself comparing my circumstances or situations with others. I feel like I've missed out on life's opportunities, and now it's just too late. No amount of encouragement is enough to convince me of my worth. I feel rejected if the leadership does not greet or recognize me. I constantly seek the approval of others and easily fall into people-pleasing. I am easily offended or embarrassed by discipline or correction. When I interact with people, I feel like I'm on the outside looking in. I think if I had the opportunity, I would do a better job than the current leader or teacher. And I think that nobody can understand me or understand what I'm going through. So maybe some of these things that I mentioned were something, things that you identified with, where there are maybe seeds of rejection that have planted, roots of rejection that have grown. So how can we heal then from this pain of rejection and allow God to take up those roots so that we can then walk in freedom? Now remember, Satan is the father of lies. And as long as we agree with and we come, in, come into agreement with those lies, he has power over us, even if we are Christians. Okay? So the only way that we can be set free from those lies is choosing to believe what God says about us because it is the truth that sets us free. Okay? So we're going to go now and we're going to go pretty quick, but we're going to be studying six truths that are fundamental Okay, fundamental uh, in our faith that are going to help us heal from any root of rejection, but they're also going to help us close the door on the enemy, right, so that even though he's going to try to attack us, he no longer has this power over us. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Okay, so let's go. Point number one, truth number one that we need to believe. I want everybody to say it with me. I am a child of God. Oh, of course, Pastor Jalen, of course, we're all children of God, right? Well, first let me say this. One thing is to know, and another thing is to believe, okay? I can know that I'm a child of God, but not really believe it and take ownership of this truth and to close the door on the enemy. Now, are all of us here children of God? Not necessarily. Now relax, okay? If you're not sure, today can be the day where you become a child of God. Because you know what? I've realized that sometimes we think, whether it's uh, a lie of the enemy, honestly, or, you know, just any misconception, we think that because we've been in church for a long time, we grew up in church, maybe we uh, know all the songs, right? We serve on a team. We think that church membership is what makes us a son or daughter of God. But that is not the truth. I've asked many times in opportunities just as in my role as a leader, as having conversations with others and, you know, tell me about your experience when you became a Christian, when you gave your life to Jesus. And many times I'm surprised that a lot of times the responses are like, oh, well, you know, I kind of, you know, I, went, I was here since Vertical Kids and then, you know, I went through, you know, student ministry and then, yeah, I've just pretty much been here all my life. Or, well, my parents are Christians and, or my, or my grandparents were pastors, you know, they were, they were pastors and I had an uncle who was a missionary. But you know what? None of that makes us a child of God. Our good work, sometimes we think that because we do good things, that's what makes us a child of God. Or, or because we're nice, or because we serve, or because we give money to the church, that must make me a child of God, right? But that's not what makes us a child of God. What makes us a child of God is, be, is the day that we decide to surrender our life to Jesus and repent of our sins. Now, I remember... The day it was in 1997, in January 1997, I remember that moment when I understood that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. I understood that God loves me so much, but he hates my sin, and that I needed a savior. I needed someone to save me because I couldn't do it on my own. And I said, God, forgive me of my sins. I recognize you as Lord and Savior of my life. So when I say Lord, it means that I'm giving, he's now the master. I am no longer in control, right? And so, Lord, I accept the new life that you give me through Jesus. I give you control. I am yours. So when this happens, when I surrender my whole life to Jesus, right, not 50%, not 70%, but when I surrender my whole life to Jesus, then the Father accepts me and adopts me as his child. So now I ask you, I want you to consider it. I don't need you to respond out loud, but I want you to consider, are you confident that you are a child of God? Because this is the first truth, the first truth that we need to believe, not just know, we need to believe and declare so that we can come against the lie of the enemy. When the enemy comes and whispers to you and says, oh, you're not that special. You know what? You're rejected. 
No, I am a child of God. Look what Titus 3, 5 says. It says, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 15 says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. That means daddy. We, we have that relationship with him now. So that first truth is when we know that we are a child of God because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Not because my parents did, not because my, my friends did, or not because I go to church. It's because I came to this point in my life. And then the Holy Spirit draws me to the Father and he adopts me as his son. Okay? Truth number two. You ready? I am accepted by God. Everybody say, I am accepted by God. Well, of course I'm accepted. I'm a child of God. I already know that I'm accepted. Isn't that like synonymous? Well, not necessarily. So I want you to, I want you to follow this example because there's a very big difference, okay? So imagine if here, you know, in, let's think of an earthly example. If there's a biological father who has a child and recognizes that that's their child, they have their last name. Their name is on the birth certificate. They send money. They even send money to the mom to make sure that the child gets all of their needs taken care of. But that father has no relationship, never talks to them, doesn't call them, doesn't want that child. You see, that child grows up knowing that they're who their father is. They know that they're a child, but do they know that they're accepted? It's very different. You see, and many have this idea about their heavenly father. You know, I know that I'm a child of God, but I don't think that really God really accepts me. That God really accepts the way that I am, my design, the way that, you know, the mistakes that I've made, my weaknesses. I don't really believe that God wants me. You see, that's one of the lies the enemy uses. He whispers, just like he did in the Garden of Eden. You're a child. Yeah, you're a child. Because he knows that you already believe that first truth. But then he says, but not in the same, you know, capacity, not in the same level and category as others. You're a child because he has to, not because he wants you. He does not accept you. You see how dirty the enemy is? So we need to shut the lies of the enemy with God's word. God loves you dearly and has a purpose and a plan for your life. Listen to what God's word says in Psalm 2710. It says, though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Ephesians 1, 4 through 8, it says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He forgave our sins. I'm sorry, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Wow, what a promise we have in Jesus. Amen. I want you to, by the way, we're going to be going through a lot of scripture and you may not have time to like, go through all of it, but I want you to write down just the address of the verses and make sure that you are able to then later meditate and reread re -read these scriptures, okay? Because it is important that you and I not only know that we are a child of God, but that we are accepted by him and that we see ourselves as God sees us. He poured out his love and grace over our lives. Now maybe you're saying, you know, my parents didn't really want me. <laughs> I actually was an accident. Um, I was actually a result of a, an adulterous relationship of my parents. So the enemy begins to whisper, you see, you weren't wanted. You were an accident. You weren't in anyone's plans. You are nobody. So that is what the enemy does. So we need to unmask him and say, wait a second, that is not truth. That is a lie. And so even above, even in the midst of our parents' sin or any situation, in the moment that you were conceived, God knew you and he had plans and a purpose for your life. Look what Jeremiah 1.5 says. It says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. It is so imp important that we know and believe what God's word says about me, about ourselves, 
and, and not just know it, but believe it. Know that I'm not just a child of God, but I'm also an accept, I am accepted by God. Let's go to truth number three. Remember, these are truths that we need to know and believe and confess so that we can have, so the enemy has no longer, does not have power over us. So number three, forgiveness sets me free. Say it with me. Forgiveness sets me free. This truth is so important. It's so fundamental. And honestly, we could spend the rest of the message just talking about this, but because I want to make sure we go over all the points, um, I'm just going to go over a few verses. But it is important that we understand that if there is any root of rejection from our past or even our present, they don't disappear. Okay? Roots of rejection don't disappear because time has gone on, because a lot of years have gone over, or maybe we just tried to, maybe it was just so painful that we just thought that changing our environment or changing our, our, our location, maybe if I just go to another state or another city, or maybe if I just have a new group of friends, I'm not going to have to deal with that pain again. Or you know what? You know, I'm just going to just going to divorce this marriage, get into a new marriage, and then if I have a new marriage, then, then I'm not going to be able to not have to suffer with this pain of rejection. Or you know what? I'm going to just go to another church because, you know, this church, that hurt me, this offended me, and so if I go to another church, then I don't have to deal with it. But remember, guys, it's not about cutting the apples. It's not cut cutting the fruit. The root's still going to come up, right? The root is still going to be there. So we need to let allow the Lord to pull up the roots, to, to identify the roots. And the only way to take out the root of rejection is choosing to forgive those who have hurt us. You know, when I read this questionnaire, maybe it brought up a lot of hurt and pain and offenses that you have for your, from your past. But you know what? God wants to heal them, and he can heal them. But it begins with forgiveness. Oh, I don't really like forgiving, you know. I, I don't really feel like it. You know what? None of us do, right? We don't just wake up one day and say, oh, what a beautiful day. Oh, you, today I feel like forgiving. I hope somebody offends me so that I can go and forgive them. Oh, I hope it's a good one, right? Who does that? No one. No one ever has ever uh, said that before because forgiveness is hard and difficult for everyone, including me. I want to hold on to offenses sometimes because I feel like the other person hurt me and they don't deserve my forgiveness. But you know what? God whispers to me, you didn't deserve my forgiveness either. In love, God reminds me of how much he has forgiven me of my sin. And not just a long time ago, every day. And I understand that forgiveness is not led by my feelings. It is an act of obedience. And the Bible has so much to say about this topic of forgiveness. I want to just read a few verses. Mark eleven twenty five, 25. It says, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. We see here that forgiveness is a command. Hebrews 12, 15 says, so after each, I'm sorry, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. You see, when we hold on forgiveness, it grows a deep root of bitterness. And not only does it affect us and, and damage our relationships, right? It's complicated, making our relationships even more complicated. It corrupts so many. And that's why the enemy uses this as a, a plan, as a weapon against us. So I want to tell you that if, whenever those moments feel, you know, I don't feel like forgiving, I want you to go back to truth number one. And I want you to remember that we are a child of God because of the forgiveness that Jesus offered us at the cross, right? And tell him, be honest with him. Look, you don't need to, you don't need to like cover it up for God. You can tell him, God, I, I do not feel like forgiving this person. It is hard for me. I need your forgiveness. And God then extends his forgiveness to us and gives us the, the ability to forgive others. 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, when you forgive, uh, this is Paul speaking. He says, when you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit so that Satan will not outsmart us. Remember, that's what I was telling you. I don't want Satan to outsmart you. I don't want him to outsmart us anymore. He's been doing this for too long. For we are familiar with his evil schemes, it says in God's word. We have to be familiar with his schemes. Because once we are familiar with his schemes, then, then we can see them coming. It's not scary anymore. Now we catch that, that, that lie of the enemy and we, we reject it in Jesus' name. And so many times, this process of forgiveness, and I'm not saying, you know, it's very different to forgive somebody because, you know, they didn't, whatever, they forgot it was my birthday or whatever it is, something small, to, to something that is very serious, like some of the things we read today. I understand. I'm not trying to minimize these offenses. But I can tell you that through, through Christ, we can do it, and I can, t and I can tell you that 
It is so much easier when we have others around us. People, believers that are praying with us, that are supporting us, that are walking alongside us. It is possible. And so that's why we really encourage people to be part of life groups here at Vertical Church. It's amazing and it's wonderful that you come to church on Sunday, that you connect online. But there is something so powerful that happens when we are intentionally connecting with the body of believers, with God's people. And we're able to confess to each other and say, you know what? I'm dealing with this right now. This, this is something I have been able to forgive. And can you pray for me? Can you walk with me along this journey and help me identify what that next step is? You know, here at Vertical, we even have special groups that are dealing with this specific area because we know it's so important and so prevalent. And that's our freedom groups. And I want to say that they are amazing. And I encourage you, whenever you have the opportunity, just do it. Do it because God does mount amazing things through our freedom groups. But I want to tell you something else. That's not the only place. That's not the only place that God can bring freedom in your life, okay? I can tell you that the Lord helped me walk through a process of forgiveness and freedom in a public high school in Cooper City High School with a Christian teacher. So don't limit God and think that only if I do freedom or only if I do this. No. If God sees your heart and you're willing. See, Open your mouth, right? Tell a, a believer that can t- tell them what you're going through and help have them walk with them. Connect to whatever your life group is. Even if it's an outre- like, outreach life group or a prayer life group or a Bible study, just tell your leader, hey, this is where I am. Because look what the power of confessing is. In James 5, 16, it says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. You see, when we forgive, we free ourselves from those roots of rejection. Truth number four, I need to believe and confess the truth. I need to believe and confess the truth. I know a lot of these points are just very basic, but we need to know these. These We need to know these points. Now, what truth am I talking about? The Bible, okay? I need to believe and confess God's word, okay? I need to believe and confess that I am a child of God. I need to believe and confess that I am accepted by God. I need to believe and confess that I need to forgive, right? So John 8, 31, 32, it says, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, he says, if you abide in my word, okay, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Say it with me, free, okay? The kryptonite, right? The kryptonite of Satan, is when we not only know God's word, but we believe it and we confess God's truth. Now, these are not my words or what I think or my opinion. This is not what my mom said or my grandma said or what Oprah says. Okay, these are not just like positive thoughts. I read a really cool thing on, you know, it was a really cool post and it just cool vibes. No, no, no. It is written. It is written. What is written? The Bible, what does the Bible say? So, because this is exactly what Jesus did when he was being tempted by Satan. This is what he used. This, there's no secret. It's not like, oh, you know, we're being attacked by this invisible enemy and we just, we're just kind of left and we just have to figure it out. No, it's very clear in God's word. It is his word. Ephesians 6, when it talks about the armor of God, it says that the sword of the spirit, the word of God is what we can use against the enemy. But I want to read Matthew. Um, actually, I'm not going to read 1 through 11 because it's long, but you can write it down and read it later. This is where we see the passage in scripture where Jesus is in the desert and uh, he is fasting and the enemy comes to attack him, to try to tempt him, to cause him to fall. And we're going to read just how Jesus responds to Satan. In verse 4, he says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you are a son of God, so then Satan says in the next, in a few verses down, he says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and their hands shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You see that? Satan even uses God's word, but he distorts it. So it's so important that we know what God's word is, uh, what, what God's word says. In verse 7, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Then, uh, verse 10, then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Verse 11, then the devil left him. Okay, so we see here that Jesus used God's word. He said, it is written written. It is written. And after, you know, Satan had to flee. Okay. So it is important what Psalm 37, 31 says, the law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. So where's the law of God? 
It has to be in our heart. We have to know God's word. We have to confess it, God's word, okay? Because when the, because the enemy is going to send those, those darts of the enemy, right, those lies of the enemy, and he's going to say to you, oh, you see, your boss didn't even notice that you did that extra, you know, extra thing at work. He didn't even congratulate you for your extra hard work. He, you see, he must not like you. Oh, maybe you're calling your friends and then it goes to voicemail. <gasps> he, must have, he must have ignored my call. They, don't, they must, it must not like me anymore. Maybe, you know, I wasn't chosen to be part of that team. Or maybe it happens with your spouse. And, and oh, well, he, he didn't tell me, you know, what he thought about how I made dinner. Or my kids didn't appreciate this. So he uses all of these situations to begin whispering these lies so that we can make these movies in our mind that aren't even reality. Oh, they didn't even appreciate this. Oh, nobody even liked my post. Or so-and-so didn't even put a like on my post. They put a heart on so-and-so, but they didn't like mine. Must be that I'm not accepted. I don't belong. They didn't invite me to that party. They didn't invite me to that reunion. They didn't ask me to be a part of, of that team. They didn't ask me my opinion. They asked everybody else's opinion, but not mine. You see, so he causes these situations constantly. They're not going to go away. But the difference is it has power and control over us when there are still roots of rejection in our lives that we, haven't, that we haven't confessed and we haven't turned over to God. So the only thing that will stop these roots of rejection are believing and confessing God's word. Because the enemy is going to continue attacking. But we can say, just as Jesus said, it is written. Right? It is written, I am convinced that nor, not death or life or angels or demons or present or future, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Right? I can declare and say, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We can declare God's word when we know we believe it. But the question that I have for you is, what it is, what it is risen is in your life. What word of God is in your heart? You see, that's why it's so important that we need to know the Bible. We need to read the Bible. We need to, this is the weapon that we have against the enemy, but we don't read the Bible. We don't read it, so we don't know it. How are we going to, how are we going to say it is written if we don't have the Bible in our hearts, right? And I understand there's, I came to church, I did not grow up in a Christian family, I didn't grow up in church, so to me, reading, where, where do I even start, you know, where is this Genesis, like, what is this, how do I read it in, you know, order? Listen, that's okay, but there are many resources to help you get started, right? That's why we encourage you to come to church, right, for sure. Come to church consistently, but also get, part, get connected in a life group. There are so many life groups right now that are, about, that are Bible studies, how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, you know, a prayer group. Just talk to people and, and say, hey, I need some help. We talked about it today in our announcements. We have Right Now Media, an amazing resource that we are gifting to you. The church invests in this so that you can take advantage of these, of these uh, plans. There are studies that you, can, that you can have on your phone, on your, like, smart TV. There are no excuses for us to not get into God's word. Truth number five, I have power in the Holy Spirit. Say it with me, I have power in the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49 says, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. You and I need power from heaven to be able to believe and to live as an accepted child of God. We need power from the Holy Spirit to forgive. We can't do it in our own strength, right? We need, um, we need the power from the Holy Spirit from heaven to be able to um, stand against the temptation of the enemy. We cannot do this in our own strength. Sometimes we think if I just, you know, if I just, you know, get into the focus and I just breathe and count to 10, I am calm. I have this. I am going to do amazing. This is, listen, we need to be very careful because a lot of these positive and, and just these practices um, is part of a new age movement that is, is really creeping into the Christian church. And I need to, need to say that this is not from God because that does not have power, okay, for me to look in the mirror and say, you are amazing, you are special. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. Do not replace that with God's word, okay. This does not have the power to go against the attack of the enemy. These roots of rejection are going to disappear when we are able to receive power from the Holy Spirit and believe and confess God's word with authority, okay? When we can recognize what the lies of the enemies are and we can take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. We, in order to do that, we need power from heaven. 
John 14, 26 said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is Jesus speaking. You know what? You may not remember exactly where in the scripture it is. I don't know if it's happened to you. Sometimes you're praying for somebody or you're going through a situation and a scripture just pops in your mind. Don't worry so much as if you know, oh, I don't remember if that's like 1 Thessalonians or is that Jeremiah or Old Testament. Like don't, the Lord is going to remind you of the word that you need in that moment. But it is important that it has to be in your heart. We need to have almost like a, like a savings bank, right, of, of Bible in our lives where the Holy Spirit is then able to remind us because it says that he will remind you of what I've told you. But if you don't even know what he's told you, how is he going to remind you? So what happens is many times we're like struggling and we're struggling and we don't feel like we can walk in authority. We're dealing with the same situation over and it's been years and years and years and dealing with the same thing. It's because we're trying to depend on other people's bank of God's word. And, and in other people's power in the Holy Spirit than what God is doing in us. So we need to make sure that we know God's word and that we have uh, that bank, right, that savings bank where, where, the, where the Holy Spirit can remind us because that way we can respond against the lies of the enemy. We can, we can know that we are accepted children of God, that we have, we're able, he gives us the power to forgive. He gives us the power to believe and confess through the power of his Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Because of the power of the Holy Spirit, then we can be witnesses. We're not doing it in our own power or in our own ability or our own strength. Let me tell you, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that I am standing here where I am sharing this word with you. It is not in my own power because if it was up to me, I would not do this. It's uncomfortable and it's scary, right? But I had to remind myself, even as I was preparing this message, I'm not doing this in my own strength. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we know that, we can stand firm against the enemy. The final truth, my enemy is defeated. My enemy is defeated. I want you to know that Jesus is greater than our enemy, and he is greater than any root of rejection in our lives. We need to believe and confess that our enemy is defeated. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, it says in scripture. And if I don't believe and confess these six truths, right, I'm not going to be able to stand firm against the enemy. Any attack, any little banana that he throws, I'm just going to slip and fall, and here I am again, right? Same situation, same thing. God has given us the weapon that we need. He's given us the truth of his word. Romans 8.37 says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Overwhelming victory is yours. We do not need to walk around defeated. We have, the, we have the victory in Jesus and he has defeated the enemy. Look what it says about the enemy in Revelation 12.11. It says, and they have defeated him, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. We um, have victory over the enemy because he has been defeated by the blood of the cross. And also by our testimony. And so it's important that we understand that rejection is not going to just disappear. It's not just going to vanish, right? Right? But it doesn't have to have power over us. Rejection is still going to happen. We're still going to experience some kind of rejection. Somebody's not going to like what you said. Somebody's not going to like you as a person. Somebody's going to say something that's going to hurt your feelings. It's going to happen. That is just the reality of the world we live in because, say it with me, people. It's complicated, right? It's complicated. However, that rejection doesn't have to sink us. It doesn't have to defeat us. It doesn't have to, we don't have to wallow in this rejection. Because when we understand our identity and our position in Christ, when we understand the power that we receive through the Holy Spirit, when we are able to shut the door on the enemy by choosing to forgive out of obedience, not because I feel like it, but because I know that the enemy has power when I don't forgive, I'm giving him territory in my life. When we are able to do that, we know that the enemy is defeated. And then even though rejection will come, that doesn't offend me. Everybody here, everyone can choose to reject me, not like me. But you know what? My identity is not in that. My identity is knowing that I am a daughter of the Most High. Right? We all experience rejection. 
I just think the enemy is so sneaky. He's so dirty that he tries to make us think that we're the only ones feeling this way. But he's lying to everybody. He's telling us all the same thing. Oh, you see, you're not pretty enough. Oh, you're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not good enough. You're not worthy. He's telling us all the same thing, maybe just in different areas. But we need to identify what are those lies? Where does that root come from? Because again, we need to get to the root in order to no longer see that fruit in our lives. I hope that God has ministered and spoken to you today. And if there is something that is, the Lord is working in your heart right now that he, maybe he's brought to the surface, that's a good thing. Because that means he wants to work and he wants to heal and he has the power to. And so I want to encourage you that after today's message, if there's something that God is doing in your heart, I, I want you to talk to somebody about that. Somebody who loves the Lord, that you can talk to them and, and not just stay here. It's not just about information. What are we going to do with this word? What are we going to do with this, right? How are we going to walk in those next steps of healing? So I want us all to pray right now. I want to encourage you right now just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Not because bowing our heads or closing our eyes is anything magical, but I think that it just gives us a private moment with God so that we don't have distractions of the people around us or anything else. I want you right there where you are. If you're at home and you're online or you're here in this building, I want you to have an opportunity right now to close your eyes and connect with God. I want to pray over you right now. Father, I thank you for your word. Because your word is truth. And your word sets us free, Jesus. Free from the lies of the enemy, from the lies of rejection, from pain from our past. It is your truth that sets us free, God. So I pray that today, God, you would have your way in each of our hearts, Lord. Lord, that you would maybe dig deep. Maybe the roots have been there for so long, it just seems like so under the surface. We haven't even really even, we didn't even realize they were there. But you see them, God, and you love us so much that even though you accept us as we are, God, you don't want to leave us in the same way, Jesus. You want to pull up every root of every seed that the Father has not planted. And so I pray that you would do that right now, Lord. That you would bring healing, that you would bring uh, restoration, that you would bring reconciliation, God, to relationships that have been damaged because of roots of rejection. I pray, God, that we would no longer be fooled by the enemy's schemes, that we would no longer be ignorant of his plans against us, but that we would unmask the enemy, God, that you would just point it out and show us, Lord, every time he is trying to, to, try to get us to believe his lies, Lord. Because that's all he can do. He, all he can do is lie to us. But when we have your word, Lord, we have the truth that sets us free. I thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for your word. And I just pray, God, that you would have your way. Have your way and that you would bring um, healing and hope to every single one of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God is so good. He loves us so much. We can choose to continue with having these roots of rejection. No one's going to force you to get rid of them. But why? Why live a life so bound when we have freedom in Christ. That's what he came to give us is freedom, to live an abundant life here on earth. Not free from pain, but free from the power of the enemy over us. And so maybe you're here and you're kind of stuck on that first point. You know, am I really a child of God? You know, I kind of thought that, you know, I'd been in church my whole life or because I come and I'm here, because I give, because I serve. I, I thought that's what made me a child of God. But you've learned today that in order to be a child of God, you have to come to that moment, that point in your life, like I did back in January 1997, and recognize that, that you've sinned against God. That yes, maybe others have sinned against you, and I'm not saying they haven't, and I'm not saying it was right, and I'm not saying it didn't hurt. But that we've also sinned against God. And that we need His forgiveness. We need to repent of our sins and recognize him as our savior because no, no good thing we could do could ever earn us our salvation, our eternal life. And so if, you, if that is you today, I want all of us to bow our heads again, again, just to have this moment of privacy with God. And if you have any doubt at all, if you are a child of God, today can be the day 
that you have that confidence. So maybe you right now you feel like what happened to me that day, that my heart was kind of pounding out of my chest and I knew that God was knocking on the door of my heart. If that is you and today is that day, I want to tell you that today is a day of salvation. And so I want us all to, to repeat this prayer together. And I want to say to you that are saying this prayer for the first time today, um, that it's not about the prayer. It's not about repeating these words. They're not necessarily magical. The power is in our faith, right, and our sincerity before God because he can see our heart. He sees the condition of our heart. And so if you're making that decision today for the first time with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I want you to raise your hand because I want to know who I'm praying with today. Who, who am I coming into agreement with today as we say this prayer together? If you're online, you can also raise your hand. You can also let us know. So is that you? Raise your hand if that is you today. And you want to be sure, you want to be confident that you are a child of God because you have received him as Lord and Savior. Amen. I want, to, I want us all to repeat this prayer together to support those that are, making, are saying this prayer for the first time. Let's say it all nice and loud. Thank you, God, for loving me, for offering me your forgiveness. I recognize today that I am a sinner, that I have sinned against you, and that I need your forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to take the cross in my place, for paying the price for my sins. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus lived, died, and resurrected to forgive me and to give me eternal life. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. I surrender to you. I need you. I believe in you. I give you my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Wow, what a beautiful message on relationships. We're so thankful for a relevant church where we can get a message and apply it to our lives, our daily lives. The Bible teaches us to be doers of the word and not only hearers. So I encourage you guys to apply this in your life this week. Also, if we wanna celebrate, if you made the decision to follow Christ in your heart, we wanna celebrate with you. So please let us know by texting the word Jesus1, Jesus number one, at the number 94,000. We'd love to celebrate this victory with you. Well, that concludes our service. God bless you and see you next Sunday.